on Montana PBS. Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, the MSU Extension Service, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, the Montana Bankers Association, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, and the Gallatin Gardeners Club. and fungicides and pesticides are old. The veggies you are growing in your garden start to mold. If the ants are attacking and you're having a hard time, call Montana Egg Live. we in the ditch and the opal's got an itch. Ticks upon my sheep and the wool is really cheap. The gophers in the pasture are even worse than last year. Montana Egg Live, where are you? Good evening. Welcome to Montana Ag Live, originating tonight from the studios of KUSM on the beautiful campus of Montana State University and coming to you over the Montana television system. I'm Jack Reesman. I'll be your host tonight. And if you're wondering what these two big jugs are doing in front of me, one from Missoula, one from Bozeman, we're not taking sides anyplace, but they are some unique opportunities that Montana growers have in the future, and we're going to talk about that as we move through the evening. Tonight's guest is a hop grower here in the Gallatin Valley, and we're going to examine what we can do, what can happen in the possibility of growing hops for the state craft brewing industry. Before we do that, let me introduce the panel. I'm going to start way to the left, Lori Crescini. Lori is our entomologist here, runs the diagnostic insect diagnostic lab. If you have bug questions tonight, definitely call them in because she can answer them. <laughs> Our guest, Jake Tassell. Jake, thank you for coming in. Jake runs Crooked Yard Hops here in the Gallatin Valley. A little bit of background about Jake. He's an MSU grad and his degree was in mechanical engineering. Fifth generation Gallatin family, but he likes to farm better than he likes to be an engineer. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit. <laughs> Jamie Sherman, Jamie's our barley breeder, relatively new barley breeder here. And she's gonna talk a little bit about craft malt lines and regular feed barley lines as we get into the program. And we all know Toby with the mustache and beard, so <laughs> it, it's trim tonight. You look pretty good, Toby. Thanks. Okay, let me introduce the phone answers, then we'll go back to Jake and we'll look and see what he's doing in the valley. Cheryl Moore Goff on the left. Uh, Cheryl Bennett, and then Nancy Blake. And thank you guys for coming in and answering the phones. The phone number will be on the screen in a moment. And before we go there, Jake, tell us a little bit more about your operation. And you brought a few photos in that we're going to look at, which I find very impressive. So have at it. Yeah, definitely. Well, like you said, I was going to school here for mechanical engineering, and I was about to graduate. I had an internship in San Diego, so working in sunny, sunny city was, you know, you'd think it would be a dream come true, but I really just wanted to get back to the farm, and I was really excited when that was over to get back up here to Montana, <laughs> and started looking at other opportunities, because, you know, it was a year before I graduated, you know, what am I going to do? And the opportunity for hops was, was really interesting to me. One of the engineers that worked down there had a small hop yard, and that was pretty much uh, the level of thought that went into that. <laughs> I, uh, I started Let, planning. Let's take a look at what you've done around here. Definitely, yeah. So, so we can have the, those first couple pictures, wherever they're at. They'll be up in a moment. Yeah. Um, yep. I was shocked to see how much work went into some of these hop yards. But here we are with some of the photos that we have out there. Oh, definitely. So this first photo that we're looking at here, this is the young hop cones. This is when they're about two months old when they're first starting to grow out into cones. Uh, they just grow out into these little spurs, these little buds, and then that's gonna lengthen. That's about a centimeter long and that's gonna get about three to four inches in length. And those are the full grown cones that you're looking at. That's what that's actually gonna turn into. And that's what, those cones are what are harvested off of that vine. And that's what's gonna go into beer, which is gonna make it bitter. It's gonna add aroma characteristics. The hops are gonna add all sorts of 
fun characteristics to the beer. So that's a close up of what the actually, the compound inside the hops. That's the pollen, that's called lupulin. And that's encapsulated little spheres. And when you break that, there's oils inside that, essential oils, there's different acids that depending on when you add it to the beer are gonna impart piney characteristics, you're gonna get fruity aromas, you can get herbal flavors, you can get all sorts of things out of hops. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. We've got some more photos coming up here. This is what a hop yard looks like in the early stage of development. This is, I believe, one out near Manhattan. Yeah, exactly. This is our first expansion that we're working on with Highlander right now. This is six acres built out in Manhattan. This was built last fall. We're going to finish construction and start planting it sometime this spring. But yeah, that's six acres. That's what that looks like the first couple days. Okay. Yeah. Sounds like a good plan to me. I was pretty impressed when I saw what really impressed me, and I want to know how you got the name Crooked Yard out, <laughs> because if you look down these lines right here, those are not crooked. Well, they neglected to put pictures of our first couple yards on. <laughs> so that's, we were trying to think of a name. Uh, we, we built it, actually, so that the level of planning that went into this didn't really impress my parents. So they, they gave us this little tiny corner of a field in, that was really, really rocky that we couldn't grow anything else in. It was a dairy dumping ground, just a really pretty junk corner of the field. And we just went to town. We started putting in poles, and wouldn't you know it if every one of them didn't hit a pumpkin-sized rock. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, appreciate it, guys. Let's move on a little bit uh, from Bozeman. Uh, we've got one more photo up there. Oh, this is a little bit farther along. Yeah, yep. So this is after we, uh, we started proving to folks that the plants would actually grow, that we could, we could do this profitably in Bozeman. So we built the soil much, much better up here. Um, my dad let us take a corner of an alfalfa field and repurpose it into some hops. So we had a natural cover crop already going with the alfalfa, and the hops just, they love it up there. Okay. <laughs> and the question becomes, how do you harvest these things? Exactly. So you actually have to cut those plants. It's, it's hard to tell in the picture, but they're 15 to 18 feet tall, and they can weigh 40 to 80 pounds, depending on how wet they are. So you have to cut. There's a good picture. Perfect. So you have to cut that whole plant down and put that whole plant through a harvester that's going to rip it apart and rip those cones we saw earlier off, and it's going to separate them inside of that machine. So that black conveyor belt on the right side, that's going to be just like a fire hydrant, just spewing out cones, and then leaves are going to be just blasting out the back. Yep, that black conveyor belt, that, those trash bags there, that's how we, we just fill those one after another. Yep. My question becomes, I've always been told that most hops were harvested by hand. Uh, you're doing it by machine, is that correct now? It's, well the bulk of the labor is done by hand, yes. There's that whole plant, we have to cut that down by hand. Okay. So we're going along with just little pocket knives, throwing them in the back of pickups, and then hauling those plants to a sort of a secondary site where we actually have that harvester set up. And this looks like you're hauling them off right now. Exactly, yep, that's my little brother Joe, um, getting in there with us, getting some work done. He, you know, that's, that's probably only six plants maybe in the back of that trailer. And we've got about 7,000 plants uh, this spring, so. Big job. A lot, a lot of hand labor. Yep. All right. Exactly. We'll get back to this in a little bit. Let's move on to some other questions that have come in. Uh, Toby, why are all my pine trees turning red? Uh, well, this time of year, it's sun scorch. Um, I'm guessing, uh, just because I've seen a ton of it this year. And you would think with all the um, snowfall that we've gotten that we get some good moisture in the ground, but uh, because of the, mo the snowfall, the, the ground's still frozen. And so those pine trees, uh, whether they're pines, spruces, or firs, they're not able to take up that water and they're starting to transpire. And so we see this a lot this time of year, but it's really bad this year. We're seeing a lot of uh, trees that are, especially on the south and the, and the west side of the trees are turning red. Uh, basically because they don't have enough moisture. Okay. So um, as the snow melts and the, and the ground unfreezes, it should make it a little bit better, but uh, I think it was just really because we had this insulative effect of all that snow that kept the, the ground frozen, so it, it didn't help. All right. Um, this came in from Bozeman here, and they're curious about the craft brewing industry in the state. Uh, they want to know, number one, where do they get the malt? And Jamie, you might want to handle that. And can the hop industry in the state supply enough for the local breweries? So, Jamie, you want to go first? Well, the malt comes from all over the world. Some of it they buy from Malt Europe. 
Um, and then, um, and other companies like Breeze or RAR. And then they also purchase it from uh, yeah. European companies as well. All right. So, so that you, when you buy malt for beer, you need a base malt. And a base malt would be one of these light, more lightly colored malts that, um, that have just a very base, plain flavor. And then you also need some additional malts to add other flavors. So, for example, these darker colors would add richer flavors, depending on what kind of beer you're making. Are any of these malts, you know, I'm looking at it from a Montana perspective. Right. I like what Jake's doing. I know we're increasing the craft beer industry in the state immensely. Is there a lot of malt being produced in this state? So that's just starting to happen, and it's really exciting. Uh, malt, uh, craft malt companies are starting to rise up just like the craft beer companies. And um, so in the valley alone, there's three or four that we know of. We know of several that are uh, developing up in the northern part of the state. So there's little pockets developing okay. all around the state, but it's in the very early stages. And one of the cool things that we're getting to be involved in is that we have a malt quality lab. And so the people that are trying to develop malt to make sure that they're getting really good quality, we're testing it for them and giving them feedback on if they're getting good quality or not, and then helping them actually develop their process. So we're giving them advice on what they should do differently to improve the quality of okay. their malt. So we're involved in that, in the development of this new industry that we're really excited about. Yeah, I, look, I looked online, and I don't know if the viewers realize this, but we're approaching a $100 million industry in the craft malt in the state of mm. Montana. And I think right now about 35, maybe 38, and it's increasing percent of the goods that go into a beer, a craft beer, are purchased or grown in the state of Montana. So it is a big industry. Jake, could you supply enough hops for the craft brewery industry in the Gallatin Valley? Probably not tomorrow, <laughs> but maybe someday. <laughs> What's it take? To, you know, a barrel of beer is, uh, I think, 30 gallons, if I'm correct? Mm -hmm. it's, it depends. Same with the malt question. It really is depending what hops you're using based on the style of beer. If you're making lighter beers, lagers, or, you know, blondes, you're going to use different ingredients, IPAs, stouts. You know, it's, it's all completely different. Um, one of the bigger problems is... So there's different additions in the beers. There's like hops that are gonna add bitterness, like I said earlier, there's gonna be floral characteristics. And a lot of those varieties that are really popular right now with brewers just don't grow very well here or they're proprietary. So they're things that we couldn't do. Okay. However, there are, there are varieties that we could easily meet the state's demand for. So similar to the base malt, how Malt Europe is providing a malt that may be 60 to 80% of a beer recipe, we could easily grow bittering hops and aroma hops that might be 60 to 80%. Okay. of the hops and recipe. I'm going to point out a little bit more about that. Um, for this particular brewery, Bridger Brewing here, yep. you supply all the hops, and they probably use more than what you can supply. They use way more than we can okay. supply right now. But <laughs> your, one of your mm -hmm. hop yards supplies this one. Mm -hmm. Another one that's being developed will supply this brewery in mm -hmm. Missoula, Highlander Missoula Brewing Company. We have 83 brewery, 73 currently, and 12 more online. Is there opportunities there for people to oh, yeah. get in the hop industry? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely, yeah. There's, when, when I started this back in 2015, me and a couple of the other hop growers, there was only three of us at the time, sat down and looked at what kind of acreage Montana could support back then. I think there was 47 or 48 breweries back then, and it was around 150 acres of hops to supply just that many breweries. Obviously, now we're approaching... 80 craft breweries, so we've almost doubled, right. and the hop acreage has just barely increased. So we're, we're seeing a minute increase in hops <laughs> and a huge jump in brewing. So the opportunity here, incredible, yeah. Well, typically, Lori, when they talk about a new crop like this, this person called in, and we don't have a pathologist here. There are some diseases. They want to know if there's insect issues with hop production. Yeah, I actually brought one here today. It's this is uh, so far. We were just talking about this before the show that, uh, that that there really aren't very many reported around the state. But this one, this is the the Prinus borer. This is the Prinus californicus. It's it's not. It, we actually have it established in the state, and it is a pest in the state. But so far, hasn't been a pest of hops. But it is a pest of hops in in other states. 
Uh, the other pests that we have that are potential pests of um, hops are, uh, we have uh, hop aphid and we also have spider mites that are, that are potential. And we, we have the strawberry root weevil. Uh, we have several pests that, that are in the state. Um, I'm not sure about the hop aphid, but several ones that are, that are kind of generalist pests that, that could really uh, hit hops if, if the opportunity arises. So, but that, this is one of the big ones that the okay. root, it hits the roots of the hops. Um, spider mites. Probably not a big issue here because it's cooler here. Is that correct? We have a huge spider mite issue on, on, on lots of our, okay. lots of our, maybe not so much on the crops, but in the, in the urban industry, we have, I mean, spider mites are a big problem in July and August. Uh, yeah, usually when it's hot and dry. Yeah. And that's when we get a lot of, I get a lot of mite calls and I'm sure you do too. I do too, yeah. When it's hot and dry, especially on like raspberries, you see a lot of mites on, on raspberries, house plants in the middle of summer when it's hot and dry. Uh, so yeah, we do see. Are there, are there other crops that you see downy and powdery mildew affecting? Those are like the big fungal issues for hops. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't really know my, uh, my plant quality very well. We have mildew on a lot of different things. Yeah. Lots of things. Yeah, lots of things. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And Jake, I'm pretty sure you're gonna be finding it to some degree on hops. It probably mm -hmm. will take a period of time to get here, but you will have it. And you'll start seeing it actually when it cools off and dries up a little. Yeah, on that note, when, when do you harvest your hops? Uh, we harvest ballparking between August 25th and like September 10th. That's been kind of our traditional harvest date, which is pretty early considering. Okay, mm -hmm. does a cold winter and a prolonged winter like this, is this gonna hurt your hop production for the year? The plants get started a little bit later? It, it potentially could. If we had an early, you know, an early fall like we did last year, it could truncate things a little bit. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, mm -hmm. are the, well, this person, number one, wants to know, what's the difference between feed barley and malt barley? Well, the difference primarily is uh, in quality traits, that the feed barley usually doesn't have the same quality traits as malt barley. So if you were just looking at them out in the field, this is a malt barley head. Notice it's a two-row Barley, um, notice that the, uh, the seeds are very similar in size and shape all the way down the head and a consistency. But the main difference between malt and feed is something that you can't see. It's the level of protein. Okay. So with a feed, you'd of course want to have higher. a higher protein because it's more nutritious. But with high protein, that messes up the malt process and the brewing process. And so usually when uh, maltsters contract malt with a grower, they'll ask them to meet a certain protein specification. This is one example in Montana where you can get more money for low protein. Uh, you can, which, you know, with the, in the wheat world, you get it's more right. money for high protein. And so that's a big difference. But then there's other malt quality traits that we look at as well. And so they have to be good for all of those quality traits. So a question, as I drive, drive around the state and I don't know a whole lot about malt, malt barley, um, I do see the large elevators that seem like they're owned by the larger beer mm -hmm. companies. And, um, and then we also know that there's these 80 uh, you know, craft brewers. Is there a difference in malt that, uh, let's say, the craft brewers are looking for in a, in a, a microbrew versus a macro brew? There is a difference. So the uh, big companies use other... Uh, like rice or corn to provide sugars and starch. And that, they're called adjunct brewers because of that. So the yeast is fermenting um, starch from other sources than just the barley. Mm -hmm. Most of the craft brewers are all malt brewers. And so they're just reliant on the barley to give them everything they need. So they need even more sugars and lower protein. So they have a uh, stringent requirements mm -hmm. than the adjunct brewers oftentimes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Uh, this one I don't know about. Jake, do birds like hops? Will they eat them or do you have problems with birds? You know, I've, I've kind of been curious about that because it's, it's definitely not the deer. They've left them alone yes. this far. Mm -hmm. But there, sometimes you'll see, and it might be, I don't know what's going on, but sometimes the very tip, there's like a growth note at the very tip, looks like asparagus, and that's what's actually like tracking the growth of the hop. And if that goes away, the plant's gonna stop growing and you have to train a new vine. But that tip, sometimes, you know, very rarely it'll, it'll be gone. 
but typically the birds avoid it because once you've got your poles up and your cable up and all your twine, it's just a maze and you'll see a bird fly down there sometimes oh, yeah. and freak out and just nope. <laughs> you know, and that's the same in strawberries. People that yeah, have yeah. problems with strawberries will string modern film in their strawberries and the robins, if you like them or dislike them, <laughs> will fly in. And once they hit that, they can't see it obviously. Mm -hmm. It scares them and they're gone. Mm -hmm. I don't know if birds like hops, I would doubt it because they are a little bit bitter. But mm -hmm. Okay, there's another one here and this one I don't know about. This came in from the High Line. Uh, wild hops are available in the area. Are they okay to grow for beer use or not? Depends. Um, there's actually, there's an entire breed of hops bred specifically for ornamental use. So it's, if you try and brew beer with ornamental hops, it's gonna taste disgusting. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. You can generally check. If you break open the cones, feel it, smell it. If it smells, you know, hoppy, pungent, floral, good to go. All right, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, Lori, this question came in from Bozeman. They have lots of small white flies on his red grapes in the fall. How can he control them and they and they or they don't appear to be doing any damage? And along that line, we've seen an increase in white flies in the state. And does anybody know do they like hops? I, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. And and I don't know very much about I I don't haven't gotten very many calls or and on white flies, so I could follow up with you if you call my office. There was but. definitely an uptick last the last couple of years of white flies, um, grapes and tomatoes. I had I had white flies on my tomatoes last year. Oh, you did. And you know, it's just another one of those situations we're in where we ten years ago yeah. we wouldn't have talked about white flies. It would have been a non-issue. Or in the and greenhouse. Or in the, you know, greenhouse sometimes issue. you see them in the greenhouse. In fact, just talking with David Bombauer at the Plant Growth Center. This is that we have white flies in the in the in the greenhouses, especially in the uh, in the um, teaching greenhouse, you know, brought in from plant material, probably myself. Um, and uh, this is the first time that he's had white flies in in over a decade, I think. Okay. Hmm. And so it is becoming a, a bigger problem. Something to watch for. Yeah. Um, Jake, this person is interested in maybe starting a small hop yard. Mm -hmm. They do need water, correct? Quite a bit of water. Quite a bit of water, yeah. Quite a bit of nitrogen, if I'm correct. Yes, absolutely. They want to know how much it costs to start a hop yard. Like construction costs? Construction costs, and I assume plant costs. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. A rough ballpark, if you want to plant an acre of hops and put up the string, the tines, and the poles. I'd rough estimate. Eight to 10,000 per acre. Okay. That's a good estimate, yeah. So how long does it take before you start getting a return on that? So tr traditionally, the numbers that they throw out are your first year when you plant the hops, you're going to get 0%, second year 50%, third year 75 and then four years down the road 100%. I'd say bump that out to five years and, and expect that that's when you're going to hit maximum production. Okay, yeah. good. Thank mm -hmm. you for the answer. Yeah. Uh, Lori from Great Falls, uh, with the extended cold weather we've been having, do you think we'll be seeing less aphids this year? I, that depends on, I, I don't think we'll, a couple of years ago we had a heavy rain kind of at, in, in the spring, which I think washed out a lot of natural enemies and we ended up having a, a, a higher aphid year because it took away a lot of the good predators. So it just kind of depends on, on what aphids you're talking about, but um, they're, they like stress dry crops usually or dry ornamentals. So, but we also have things like the leaf curl ash aphid that depending on timing will, so the kind of the earlier aphids that cause, cause uh, some curling leaves and things like that. I think, I think we're still gonna see aphids. Yeah, okay. I think it, we, might, uh, yeah, we might wash away some of the natural enemies here. You know, this question came in from Bozeman here, and I, I will say that there are quite a few people, and we even have some on campus in the Mathry Courtyard, that grow hops kind of as an ornamental plant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Last year, this person said they had a ton of a aphids on their hops, and they would like to know, uh, is there a way to get rid of them without chemicals? Probably not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we were t just talking, when, when the populations get really high, it's really hard to use natural enemies for that. So, I mean, lady beetles will come in on their own, and you could use parasitoid wasps, uh, and you could release those. But when they've gotten to a point where they're exponentially high, you usually have to resort to, to chemical means. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could use horticultural oils and things that are a little bit less toxic, but, uh, but mostly when they're, when they're getting to those levels, you, you have to start off at least with some sort of chemical intervention and then maybe think about the natural enemies after that. Okay, thank you. 
this is going to be an education for me, but this person from Missoula would like to know the process, the malt process, and how you make beer, and what stage do you add the hops and the malt and so oh, this forth. This is the whole can of worms. The whole can of worms. I, mean, I love beer, yeah. but I, I, I've never made it. I don't know exactly the process, and don't you say anything. <laughs> Are you a home brewer? <laughs> no, I'm not a home brewer, but I know that he doesn't make it, but he likes to drink it. <laughs> you guys want to try to answer that? So it's focused on brewing, right? Well, we and, and the malting process, too. What is malt? Do you just throw the uh, malt barley in, or do you have to grind it? Or Well, malt is actually germinated seed okay. that has then been kiln. So the malt process requires the seed to be soaked in water, and then there's air rest. And that process alone can take um, four days or so. And then the seed is allowed to germinate more fully. And so the little rootlets and the stems begin to grow. And then once it's reached the appropriate stage, then it's put into a kiln or an oven. And then that dries it all back down. So you start with grain that's dry, and then you get it to about 45% moisture through the malt and steeping process. And then you kiln it down to uh, a low uh, moisture again, like 5% or something like that moisture. And then that grain is stable, the malted grain then is stable to then go to the brewer. Okay. Um, the, what the process is doing, why you do that, is really to make the starches and proteins available for the brewing process. So the germination process breaks down the cell walls in the endosperm and, and breaks down the proteins and makes the starches available that then, then will provide the sugars for fermentation. So, that being said, Jake, when do you throw the hops in, or how do you introduce the hops into the, the mix? So you, you typically would have, in a classic brewing setup, you're gonna have three additions. So during the boil, while you're boiling the sugar water that's been made using the malt, right. you can add hops at the beginning, and this might be a 60 or 90 minute boil. You can add hops at the beginning, they're going to impart bitterness, and then you can add hops at the very end that are gonna impart aroma. And then once the beer's done fermenting after two weeks, you can do what's called dry hopping. So that's like making tea. You're gonna just take a whole bunch of hops, put them in a big sock, throw them in the beer, and that's really gonna bump the aroma up. Okay. You wanted to say something to Yes, me? Sue, uh, one of my favorite things to do as I travel around the state is <laughs> to you know, go to the local brewery. Uh, you know, in fact, I was just in Dillon, and you know, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I know the answer, but can you, can you tell me the answer? When you look at these different beers, they have two things. They have ABV, which is alcohol by volume, and then mm -hmm. they have these numbers. Oh, the IBUs? Are, yeah, the yeah. IBUs. And what does that stand for, and what is the range for those folks that may not know what they are. So IBUs, when you're looking at beers, IPAs, hoppier styles, um, typically are gonna be where you're really gonna see that. You're gonna see a number generally between zero and 100, and that's gonna give you an idea of how bitter that beer is gonna be. But that, that can be a little bit of a trick because that, that's bitterness imparted during the boil. That's not bitterness imparted during other, other things that you can do to the beer. So if you see a beer that says zero IBUs and it tastes bitter and hoppy, that's, that's because they did some after the fact kind of trick. But if you see a beer that says, you know, five, 10, 15 IBUs, it's, it's gonna be more of like a stout, maltier beer. And what um, does IBU stand for? International bittering, Bitterness Units. So it's, it's something <laughs> you know, that you I love calculate. That. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? Easier than insect terms, yeah. <laughs> I hate to say it, I w always wondered, but I thought I'd be too stupid if I asked. But now I know, and thank you. I see it posted in every microbrew or craft brew house you go into. Good information, I like that. Um, we need to get some brewers calling in. I feel like we're watching <laughs> some. <laughs> uh, These are questions Lori, for them. Correct this. <laughs> uh, from Helena, uh, this, I've never heard this before. This person has baby box elder bugs. They want to get rid of them. And what does a baby box elder bug look like? It, it looks, you know, actually we get, uh, sometimes I get people thinking that those are bed bugs. So it's good that they don't think that that's what they are. They're, they're, uh, they call them the nymphs. Um, they actually are just the, the smaller stage of the, of the box elder bugs. And they're just, most of them are just waking up right now. They're overwintering in, their, in our walls. And um, they really hmm. don't, uh, best thing to do is just to kind of vacuum them up. 
Uh, they don't really cause any any harm to the box elder trees. And if you have if they're not if you don't have a box elder tree or a maple tree around, you're, they're probably coming from your neighbor's house, and you're not going to be able to do much about it. So what if they're crawling up your siding or all over your patio and Shop driving back. you crazy? <laughs> yeah, it's hard to control them. You could do a, a kind of a, a perimeter spray in the fall that's the best time to take care of the box elder bugs because that's when they're congregating on the the outside of the house so if you're, you're starting to see them in the house right now and starting to see them wake up maybe have that on your radar in the fall and you, and you could do some sort of perimeter spray with some sort of residual to keep them from coming in something like pyrethrin yeah the only reason i know this is i was raking up some leaves along the out south side of my house and they were crawling out <laughs> by the thousands yeah and mm -hmm. yeah the pyrethrin came out okay you know, a They're good old up. vacuum sweeper inside works pretty good. Inside, too. but not outside. Not there was outside. too many of them. Okay. I didn't have a shot that big enough. Okay. <laughs> um, I figured this question would come in, Jake, because we're getting a lot of interest in hops in the state mm -hmm. and also tonight. Obviously, they want to know how valuable are hops. And there is a net worldwide shortage, I'm told, or there has been. That's actually, that's kind of a misnomer. This year, um, the, the acreage production is a basically doubled in the okay. last five years. We went, f I, I don't want to botch these numbers, but it's effectively doubled. All right. Um, that's, and that's partly, there's a surplus this year, and that's partly because the hops take so long to get going. So when there was that big shortage, that big drought, so many of these hop yards thought, you know, oh no, that here, or, you know, here's some opportunity, and they put in all kinds of new acreage. And that this year, five years down the road, is kind of starting to, you know, really provide some fruit. So there's there's a pretty huge surplus of hops right now, but okay. the the value of the hops to the the local market is still there because it allows brewers to differentiate themselves, get a local product. You can save them shipping costs. There's a lot of other benefits there. It's not just a commodity so, setup. Price per pound or price per whatever the unit I think sold is a pound, right? It yes, it it varies greatly on the variety. Okay. Um, because of what they can do for the beer, the hops kind of are. It's like spices, effectively, if you can think about it like that. Spices are sold at different prices per pound. Um, the hop price ranges somewhere between, you know, anywhere from, I'd say, 5 to, like, $20 is, like, a pretty fair range. That higher range, a couple years ago, during that shortage, uh, one of the proprietary varieties, Citra, was going for 36 to 40 per pound. So those wow. proprietary varieties are extremely valuable. And the you know the lower end varieties, if, they're, if you've got you know 2014, 2015 year crop that's been in storage for five, six years, it's still good. But it's um, there's something called the HSI, the Hop Storage Index, and it's kind of like a half life for a hop. So if that's what percentage of hop oil is going to degrade and and how how much you're going to lose per year. So those hops get pretty cheap because they get less useful. <laughs> Kobe, just a real quick question yeah. because uh, you know just in getting qu questions on this quite often. Um, Brewers, from what I understand, a lot of them like pelletized hops. Is that a product that you supply, or is it fresh hops? How do how do you get it to the local market versus what they would buy, let's say from Europe or from the Yakima Valley? Yep, exactly. So the overwhelming majority of hops are sold as pellets. Um, it's just really easy to store. It's really easy for the brewers to go in there with a scoop and just scoop out, you know, five pounds for the recipe. They can know exactly what they need. It's really easy to move around. You can give them in little bags. But hops are also sold as wet cones, so wet hops fresh off the vine. There was, those are only good for, you know, 24 hours, so you have to be close to a brewery, and <laughs> they can't use a ton of them, so that's not, like, a great strategy if you're looking to sell everything you have fresh. Uh, they can also be sold as dry whole leaf hops, so they'll take that whole cone and dry it and just literally make a bale, like a bale of hay. They'll just compress it and dry it out into these... 44, 55, whatever you want, pound bales, which are pretty interesting looking. They're wrapped yeah. in plastic and vacuum sealed and all that. And <laughs> well, mm -hmm. uh, on the subject of hops, which I will tell you, there must be a lot of beer drinkers in the state because we're getting <laughs> a ton of questions. Uh, this person from Missoula would like to know, do hops require cross-pollination? No, that's actually bad. Um, you can get, male, if you have male plants, some of the commercial yards use male plants for um, just to bump the pollen up a little bit, bump their lupulin production up. <coughs> but it's like one in 10,000 is, or one in a thousand, I can't remember which exactly, but male plants, you do not want cross-pollination. That's, that's bad. You start to get seeds. Okay. They'll actually go hermaphroditic and the seeds will start growing in the cones. Thank you. Uh, Jamie from Manhattan, uh, again, talking about the 
uh, barley side of the uh, equation. Are there any drawbacks to feeding spent grain from the malting process from breweries to cattle? No, I think that's done quite a bit. And um, uh, of course, they've lost some of the nutritional value into the beer, but um, a lot of the places sell their spent grain okay. as feed. Mm -hmm. You know, out of curiosity, do you have any feel for how much of Montana's malt barley industry is actually going into the craft brewery industry rather than the major breweries? I don't have a good an exact sense, but it is uh, changing. So the vast majority of the growers grow for a specific contract right. to one of the big adjunct brewers um, and Malt Europe contracts as well. And so then that, most of that would go to one of the big brewers. Right. And so the majority goes that way. But the thing that we're really excited about is as these craft uh, maltsters build up, then they can start contracting directly with growers. And it should um, open up the market a little bit where they're less dependent on those specific contracts. So what can happen is um, if there's a good a year for barley around the country, then the, the, those big brewers will have more mar barley than they need. And, and so then they'll cut their contracts the next year. And this has been happening. There's been kind of a feast famine in Montana. And so if we can spread that market around a little bit, then there may be a more consistent need for the growers. While I have you up, this person from Manhattan would like to know if there is a variety of barley that is more stiff strawed and would stand above the snow. And I think they're probably looking for some type of uh, food plots for birds or animals. Oh, food plots for birds or animals. You know, most barley falls down pretty rapidly with snow. Any, any that you can think of that are you know, stiff strawed and stand above the snow? Well, there's some, there's, as barley's gotten shorter, it stands up better. And so, for example, hawk it shorter than um, some of the older varieties. Um, but if they were doing it for like birds or for ornamentals, one of the things that we're working on is we've got these purple barleys that we're developing. And um, I don't know if you can tell that it's purple or not. Another thing that's different about this head is that it's also got six um, oh. seeds together. It's a six row barley instead of a two row barley, which is what I showed you before. Um, and uh, it is, uh, that might be something that would be really nice to use as an ornamental because it has that purple color to it. It would be attractive. Okay, thank you. Um, Toby, your old stomping grounds, Butte. What <laughs> shade trees are best for the Butte area and they're interested in black walnut? Uh, yeah, good shout out to Butte. Um, yeah, there's the, that's one of the problems about the Butte area is that uh, shade trees. Um, you know, if you look at the shade trees that are in Butte and what they're planting right now is uh, Canada Red Choke Cherry, which is basically a shrub that we've been trying to make into a tree for decades. Uh, and the reason that they plant a lot of it is just because it's it's hardy. Uh, it's there's a lot of issues with Butte and the fact that it's high elevation, changes in temperatures like crazy. Uh, soils are a little bit different than uh, the rest of the state. They're not actually bad, but um, the hardiness issue is the, the, the tough one. And so, um, you know, green ash right now I don't usually recommend just because of emerald ash borer possibly coming into the state. Uh, most of your maples don't usually make it because of sun scald and things of that nature. So you're kind of stuck. Um, box elder, which is a maple, um, as long as you get the, mo the male uh, so you don't have the box elder bugs around. Um, there are some hoplers that do fairly well. They're not a great street tree because they're messy. But yeah, it's just one of those towns that's just a really tough place to get things started. I know that one point in time I recommended um, thornless honey locusts, but because of the elevation, they just simply will not grow. I've had lots of people try them in Butte, and so it's just kind of a tough place to have that traditional street tree uh, okay. at this point in time. Thank you. Uh, Jake from Bozeman. And I think I know the answer to this, but we'll throw it out there. Is there such a thing as organic hops? There is, and you could do it at an extremely small scale. It just gets really difficult to do all the things we've been talking about. Um, your pest management, the big one is fertilizer. 
Yeah. Um, when you see how big those plants get, man, they are sucking nitrogen, ev everything out of the soil. They just suck it dry. It's hard to replenish that. I've always been kind of a pseudo fertility guy. I've been mean, kind of interested in nitrogen and stuff. Mm -hmm. How much nitrogen does it take to produce an acre of hops? Uh, about 175 pounds per acre. On a yearly basis? On a yearly basis, yeah. That's yeah. all done liquid, too. Yep. Liquid? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Um, this came in from Whitefish while I have you up. How do you judge international bitterness units in hops? <laughs> is there a formula? There is a formula, and if I knew more about brewing beer, I could tell you what it is. But. I don't know. We'll look that up and just see if exactly. we have an answer in the future. Uh, Billings, entomology question. Blister beetles in the vegetable gardens. How do you get rid of them, Lori? Uh, those, those could get really numerous in uh, the blister beetles. Um, usually we have the gray blister beetle here in Montana, so you could generally use an, any sort of contact insecticide on them. Okay. Yep. Um, this came in from Manhattan. There's a lot of interest out of Manhattan in hops, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Must be uh, in the hop yard. Yeah. That's exactly it. Yeah. People have seen the hop yards going up out it's there. It's hard to miss them. It is really hard to miss <laughs> them. Well, yeah, you drive it along. What is that? <laughs> uh, this person wants to know what forms can you sell high hops as, and I think we touched on that a little bit, expand on that a little bit. Exactly. So kind of the levels of processing required. The minimum processing required would, would be fresh hops. So you can take the whole cone right off the vine, don't dry it, don't do anything, put it in a garbage bag, put it in whatever, some container, and get it to your brewery, and they can make a fresh hop beer out of that ASAP. But that's the, ex the expiration on those fresh hops is going to be, like I said, 12 to 24 hours before they're just kaput. That's interesting. So you okay. can do that. You can also sell them as pellets. So you can dry them out, sell them as pellets. They're all, there's also an operation up in Kalispell that's making oil. So they have a big uh, steam distiller that they used to make mint oil out of, and you basically just extract the essential oils right out of the hops. And you, how would you put that into the beer mix at that time? So you, because it's an oil, it's not going to want to dissolve. So you would right. dissolve that with a little bit of alcohol and then put it in solution. The disadvantage is that that oil is only going to add aroma. So you couldn't do everything with oils. You, you kind of have do. to do a mix of is, everything. Is there, I mean, is there any medicinal value to hops? I'm, I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. I know that this is... <laughs> I know how I'm you taking, think. <laughs> I'm taking my extension bu uh, button off here, but, uh, you know, because uh, uh, one of my friends is, uh, does nutraceuticals, and he's talking about some of the oils that they're using from cannabis. And, mm -hmm. I mean, it's a high-value crop. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's uh, already is because of other reasons, mm -hmm. but um, by putting them into pills which has low THC, there's all of this new information about all of its benefits medically. Mm -hmm. uh, hops isn't very distinct from those no, in a really lot of similar. ways. They're in the same uh, family. Is there is there maybe a, mm -hmm. an industry that would, I mean, is there medicinal values or? Um, so two two things on that. I know that there's research being done because the oils do contain a lot of similar compounds. So you might be able to extract things here or there. It's just the the quantity is so small that it's difficult to get enough. But I know that there, if you look up hop pillows, that's been done for centuries. You can actually just take a small amount of hops, grind them up, put them in your pillow. Works as a great sleep aid. <laughs> and they actually sell pills. So it's um, they'll take different roots and blend them with hops and grind them up and... Gosh, if you thought Jack was bitter before. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Good answer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Toby from Billings, they would like to know what brand of fertilizer, you don't have to mention that, but you can tell them the analysis of whatever you use. Uh, they, know, they would like to know if you need different fertilizers for lawns, flowers, and vegetables. Yes, and I'm going to answer that question in a whole other way is to get a soil test done in each one of those, the lawn, the flower garden, and the vegetable garden because you can't really know how much you need to fertilize or what type of fertilizer unless you have an analysis done. costs about $25, uh, and that's sent. Uh, that's that's includes shipping to find out your basic needs for each one of those. I'd highly recommend it. Um, for your turf grass, though, you're going to look at a higher analysis of uh, nitrogen, and probably you're not going to find phosphorus in most lawn fertilizers anymore. So, um, and then a little bit of potassium. Most of your garden and vegetable uh, fertilizers are going to be a complete fertilizer, meaning they're going to have kind of equal amounts of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. But 
What's interesting to me is that it, you're better off to get the soil test because most of the soils, most of the uh, soil tests that I've ever gotten, you really don't need to add potassium. We have tons of potassium in our soil. We usually have enough phosphorus. And if you're a gardener that uh, has been putting things like manure or compost uh, or things in your garden, which I always get after my master gardeners about that, putting too much in your garden, um, you might have way more than enough phosphorus and potassium, um, but you might be low on nitrogen, which a lot of times you are, but it might be as simple as manganese and iron, so, or even possibly boron. I've seen a couple of boron deficiencies. So it's best to get a soil test and then uh, fertilize. Uh, to I've fertilize. seen more boron toxicity than deficiency in this state. Have you? Yeah. yeah. I see a little bit of boron deficiency that shows up um, here and there. I had okay. one in celery. It was awesome. <laughs> Bar oh. Boron uh, produces a hollow celery it in a Hutterite right. community. Uh, uh, a garden boss wanted to know how to fix that. It took me about two and a half days to find out it was a boron deficiency. I was trying to get him to market it as a Bloody Mary straw, but he had <laughs> nothing to do with that. I thought hey, it was awesome. This, this is a brewery show. We're not getting into that. <laughs> okay, uh, Jamie from uh, Shoto. And I'll just come around and say Bush and Coors are two bigger contractors for malt barley and state have cut back on their malt barley contracts. In that area, what are growers going to turn to? Feed barley? Well, um, feed barley, you asked me earlier what the difference is between yeah. feed barley and malt barley, and probably what I should have said is half the price. That's true. So a grower can only sell a feed barley for half what they can get for a malt barley. So really what we're hoping is that the craft, so what's happening with the industry is those, those bigger uh, breweries are losing market share, so they're needing less barley to meet the demand. Yeah. And what we're hoping is that the craft um, brewers will pick up the slack and then take more of the malt. I'll ask a question there. Has anybody in this state that you know of yet contracted malt barley by craft breweries or craft malt houses? No, but this is a really exciting time. So when I first started in 2015, when I met with the brewers, the craft brewers in the state, they didn't even know what varieties they were using, what malt they were getting. They didn't primarily, they didn't know a lot of times um, much about, they were just taking the quality of the malt that they were getting. Mm -hmm. um, and, but at the last Brewers Association meeting I went to uh, last fall, they were starting to talk about, thinking about as a group, uh, starting to contract um, malt directly from growers. And what will really help this is to get more uh, craft maltsters involved. We need that middleman, and, and they may be the people that then um, actually contract with the growers. The opportunity is huge, too. I yeah. mean, when you've got the land, you've got the equipment, if you have some shop space, and you know, you've got the malt barley already, like to turn it into malt to so, sell to breweries isn't overly So one difficult, of the really right? cool things is we've been contacted by growers who they know seed, they know how to handle seed, and they're starting to build their own malt capabilities. So they're taking their uh, commodity and turning it into a higher value product and then selling it directly to brewers. So a number of the people that we're working with to try to help them get their malt processes going are actually growers, and that's uh, really exciting. It is, and I would say if we did this program 10 years from today, the picture of malt barley would totally be different because oh, yeah. the opportunities, as both of you have suggested, is huge in that arena. Uh, Jake from Missoula, this is interesting. Uh, can hops grow on bean stalks instead of the poles? I don't think we get bean stalks strong enough or tall enough. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> That's a good one. I've heard of uh, Jack only, and the bean only stalk. Jack. Yeah. yeah. Jack. <laughs> We need some beans, Jack. Can you bring them by? <laughs> okay, I think we don't. I don't think so. No, I don't either. No, that would be yeah. pretty, yeah. It would <laughs> take no. over the entire plant. Yeah, it would. Uh, Lori, um, from Bozeman. They have seen little specks of dirt or small insects jumping around their window. There are hundreds of them. What are they? And don't tell me they're baby box elder bugs. <laughs> <laughs> Those probably aren't baby box elder bugs. I actually have gotten a, a lot of calls about springtails or they also call them snow fleas. I think people are getting, that's what I think they are when people are talking about little specks of dirt. They're 
They're probably even smaller than a flea, but you see them jumping around and you're not using your imagination there. They're actually jumping around. And, uh, and it, they'll come out during after huge snow melts or and sit on the top of the snow or they'll come in. We see them a lot uh, after big wet spells and they're, they're just, uh, they're good for the soil and then they'll try to return to the soil. So there's not much you could do about them. Just, just uh, maybe they're vacuum them up and just, just let them return back used, to the soil. I used to tell people when I was an agent that if you go, if they're all over the side of their house and you squish them, and, they, and it, looks, mean. it looks like there's blood or it's kind of orange to red, then it's probably clover mites. Yeah. And that is another thing that we'll see once the snow kind of goes away too. So it's either springtails or clover mites. Yes, I don't think the clover mites are out yet. Yeah, probably the, not quite yet. Yeah, it's too wet. It's and cold. Yeah. Definitely. Um, Jake from Missoula, they heard you say that you harvest hops August and September. Mm -hmm. How can you tell usually when they are ready to be harvested? And that's a good question. Yeah, there's a, so there's a couple of different methods. Um, on industrially, they have labs that'll do moisture tests and all these sorts of things, different oil content tests. Uh, the good rule of thumb, even if you're a home brewer, if you've got some plants on the side of your house, two good rules of thumb. Um, as the cones get bigger, if you pull the whole cone off and kind of grab the, the stem at the very top, if it peels straight in half and it doesn't kind of shear to one side or the other, it's pretty ripe as well as the smell. If you, if you take the cone, grind it between your hands and just kind of smell it really deep, you're gonna get grassy, 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 and then it's gonna start to get hoppy, kind of pungent, more of those sweet sort of smells. And when the grassy smell is completely gone, then it's ripe and ready to harvest. All right, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Toby from Townsend. This person has a 16 by 40 foot garden. She wants advice on how to maximize her production. Is there tricks to putting certain vegetables next to certain vegetables to get higher yields, so forth and so on? Any quick answer yeah, to that? There's no real quick answer, <laughs> but you know, you can start some of the things that grow really quickly um, and then uh, plant some later. So, uh, you know, like a great idea would be planting radish. It usually takes about 30 days, then plant your beans after. Uh, interplanting, so planting your radish in between your beans. Um, uh, you know, spinach, lettuce in between some of the longer crops. So that's how we kind of maximize. Uh, that's how you would normally right. maximize. You can also, instead of just doing rows, do broadcast plantings. So instead of one row of lettuce is broadcast uh, lettuce seed in a larger, like 16 inch row. Uh, so you'll get more harvest out of just that instead of one individual row. There's lots of little techs and trip, tip, tips and techniques to Experiment. make that happen. Yeah. Yeah, That's there are easy. some things that don't like each other. I would just research it. Um, interplanting is definitely one. Okay, thank you. Uh, quick question, they have a peony that has stopped blooming. Any reason it's next to a spruce tree? <coughs> um, I would guess that the reason the peony has stopped blooming is because it's too deep. So there might've been some mulch or because it's underneath that spruce tree, the needles are building up around that tree or that peony. Peonies do not bloom if they're too low. So uh, what I would probably recommend with that peony is either to pull away the material or really we want to actually kind of pick up that peony, lift it up a little bit, and then it's a good time to get some compost and stuff okay. around it, set it back down again. But it needs to be a little bit higher. Thank you. Uh, we're getting down toward the end, Jake. I've got some more questions here. We're going to concentrate on, on a few of these. Yeah. From Bozeman, uh, can hops be grown anywhere in Montana? As from what I've seen, I've been shocked at where they'll grow. I would say just give it a go. Don't spend too much money on it. Put five or six plants out there and see what happens. Okay. Yeah. Have you had, and you've been growing them for several years now. Have you had any winter kill with them at all or winter dieback? I haven't. I've heard that if it gets below 20 degrees, if it gets, you know, 20 below, that there's danger of winter kill, but I haven't actually seen any of that. So okay. it's, po it's possible though, yeah. Or in, on that line, this person wants to know varieties. Um, are, large variety or massive amount of different varieties available to grow or are there just a few there's well there's 140 some varieties in the world um, about 50 or so will grow in the u.s and there's like 10 or 20 that'll grow well in montana so cascade okay. centennial chinook those can't go wrong it, but which one dominates the market for my information Cascade, Cascade. By, by a mile, yep. Okay, uh, from Missoula, uh, can a producer of hops sell directly to a microbrewery or do they need a license to sell to a, mi or a craft brewer? No, from, from what I've seen, the only real restriction on what you're doing with hops is when you're applying your herbicides and your fungicides, those sorts of things. 
When you start to see spurs, you can't apply any of that, but pelletizing, you're not actually making a food product because those pellets are gonna go into the beer and be boiled. So it's okay. gonna be completely sanitary. So no, you don't need any license. Can small producer, you know, Say somebody had a big garden, a 16 by 40 garden. Mm -hmm. Could they start a hop yard in there and make it pay? Uh, I think so, yeah. It, it's definitely fun to do just to give it away to your friends, your homebrewer friends and, and whatnot. You you can get a row going, and it's that's the nice thing is it's vertical. You could throw it on a fence. You could put a couple poles up, and away and you go. And then you could become your own brewer. Yeah, then you can start. <laughs> <laughs> that's how it works. How do you like that? <laughs> I'm all for it. <laughs> yeah. All right. One last question. Mm -hmm. Lori. Quickly, how do you get rid of cluster flies in a home? Oh, that's tricky. That's one you gotta shoot for in the fall. Do a perimeter spray, something along the foundation uh, when they're congregating on the south or southwest side. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. Folks, thanks for watching tonight. It's been a really interactive program. Lots of questions, a lot of interest in the craft brewery industry in the state. It's expanding, lots of potential there. Next week, we're gonna have Stephen Van Tassel, the Department of Ag, talking about how to get rid of those pasture creatures that you really don't like to see. Again, thank you, have a good week, and hope it warms up a little bit. Good night. Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, the MSU Extension Service, the MSU Ag Experience.